All right, welcome back to Talking Stocks. This week we're we're back for episode three. Joe and Todd here, and we're going to dive right into it because there's a lot to get into this week, as usual. Um, so first, we wanted to we wanted to just get right into um, the news from from yesterday, Tuesday the sixth, about the the stimulus deal and whatever the heck is going on in in the White House. So so Todd, bring bring us up to speed. Give us some context. Uh, Joe, I don't know if you were. I don't know if you were in class, if you were available or watching it up, but man, at three o'clock, <laughs> the thing went, Mark went like, what? <laughs> like straight down. Panic and, selling. Yeah. I mean, I, as, as some listeners know, I teach a class called How to Talk Stocks at the University of New Hampshire. We were actually meeting yesterday. So, of course, I was doing my prep for the class. So, in the corner of my eye, I see this, this, this nose dive. I'm like, oh, what's going on now? What did he say this time? <laughs> exactly. That's what it was. That's what it was. It was so funny because that's what I thought right out of the gate. I was like, must be a tweet. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. You know, uh, so I go into Twitter and sure enough, I see it. And, you know, we felt pressure all throughout the afternoon. And basically, not to bury the lead too far here, right? But the tweet was, Joe, no more negotiations. I'm walking. Right table. I'm not buying the car today. <laughs> I'm walking out of the dealership. <laughs> and, uh, and that, of course, spooked, I'll call them weak hands or retail investors who have a tendency to react rather than proact, not plan to instead end up getting whipsawed. Something that we absolutely advise against, right? You know, the longer term view when it comes to planning a trade and trading a plan. But the, the, the sell-off was fierce. And I, you know what? I don't blame, I mean, investor, it's tough. It's tough gauging this, right, Joe? I mean, you Absolutely. see this stuff and it's, it's tough. Right. And like, if, if, you had, if you had asked me at four o'clock yesterday afternoon, what are the markets going to do on Wednesday morning? I absolutely would have said they're going to plummet. And here we are and everything is up. Yeah, so, I saw somebody tweet earlier figure. like, Trump's now going to algo the algo, algo the algos. <laughs> <laughs> you think you got me figured out? Well, guess what? You know, and, and that's the thing, you know, it's like the, the, what went through my mind was, I, I don't believe him. That I think that there's going to be negotiations in the background. And, you know, if we sell into the close here, then it could very well be we get a 2 a.m. tweet that says a deal has been reached. We didn't get that. But what we did get was, you know, a series of tweets saying, hey, uh, the, I'm not negotiating, but I'm okay with uh, checks to people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it almost sounds like instead of negotiating, everything is one package. Now he's interested in just negotiating like the individual pieces. Like he, he tweeted about the, the $1,200 stimulus checks and more PPP funding. So it's, al it's almost like instead of just doing it in like one big package because they're like scared of the big, you know, 2.4 trillion number or something that they're just going to break it up into smaller pieces. It's going to add up to the same thing though. Right. And I think a lot of people look at that and say, hmm, that theoretically should be easier to do, right? Who's going to argue with 1200 extra dollars in someone's pocket, right? Absolutely. And so, I mean, I think it's that, that's, that's kind of why markets bounce back so strongly and why you know a lot of people got caught flat footed this morning so again to follow up on last week episode two if for those who didn't get to catch it a uh, conversation regarding how to to game the political landscape coming into the election um just do your normal go about your normal business you know you have a system for picking stocks for a reason you have rules hopefully for sell when to sell those stocks stick to that system and stick to the rules. Try not to let your emotions get in the way and try not to um, extrapolate your own personal political beliefs to what may or may not happen with the market. The other thing, Joe, I don't know if you saw this, but we had two different Wall Street firms, I think it was Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, and then Goldman Sachs, that came out with studies saying, you know, the economy could actually improve if the Democrats win. So, I mean, again, the market oftentimes bucks what we may believe to be conventional wisdom. So just bear in mind that what you think may happen may not be what exactly plays out. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. As the past 24 hours or so have very much proven, nobody can predict what the market is going to do. So it's, it's pointless to try to say that 
you know, the, the market is going to do this if this person gets elected. I think we've, we've, tried to, we've tried to drill that into the viewers and the listeners' heads. And I really hope that everybody is, has kind of gotten the gist of our point. Yeah, probably sick of us right now. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah, well, so... You know, Joe, we have other news, right? We have other things we can talk about. We do have plenty of other things to talk about because we just moved into we just moved into Q4, so the the final quarter of the year, and this is a this is a very um, a very high time for some particular seasonal stocks. And so uh, last week, Limelight Alpha released a um, our quarterly seasonality report, and there's a lot to there's a lot to dive into there. There's there was a lot of a lot of content and a lot of different stocks, and so. I think it would obviously it's it's one thing to read through the article, but it's it's another thing to kind of hear, you know, the 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 backstory from from the mastermind from you, <laughs> the wizard. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, hey, um, I'm all about systems. I'm all about making rules and having systematic. I mean, I've, I've built a business about it around it, right? So, I mean, our system uses what I call the power seven model. It's basically seven factors that have a tendency to have an influence on future price performance. One of those seven factors is seasonality. You know, it doesn't work for every company or every industry or sector, but there are some industries and sectors and stocks where there are absolutely seasonal headwinds or tailwinds. It may be due to simply uh, end of year budget cycles, the government budget year, fiscal year, uh, and spending patterns for that. It could be tied to consumer discretionary choices such as the holiday season. Um, it, you know, all sorts of things can, can influence the seasonal patterns. And if you go into the SEC 10Q and 10K filings, one of the things many of these companies will discuss is seasonality. I think it's something that investors don't spend enough time considering. And what's unique is that of the seven factors, seasonality is one of them that you can actually pull out and there's value as far as we'll call it predictive value associated with it on a standalone basis as well. So, you know, where our score, mold, you know, incorporates seasonality as one of seven factors, you can also take a look at seasonality on its own and really come up with some interesting uh, investment ideas. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. Um, I'm thinking sectors. I'm thinking a few stocks. Yeah, yeah. Go, go for it. So I'm going to share my screen. So if you're listening at home, <laughs> sorry, but I will walk you through it uh, as best I can uh, as we share. And we are also on YouTube now. So you can look us up on YouTube if you want to watch the video and see the charts that we share uh, and everything. Um, I want to um, start off by just going down and showing you really quick the seven factors. You know, we have EPS beats, EPS growth, insider buying activity, money flow, contra short interest, valuation, and then of course seasonality, which we're going to discuss right now. On midweek last week, um, we were issued to our members the Q4 2020 seasonality report. And what this report does, it basically gives you a top level view on a sector basis, an industry basis of the strongest, uh, seasonally strongest or weakest. We, we highlight the strongest. I think it's more value in highlighting the strongest uh, based on historical performance. Um, see, uh, sectors in, in, using ETFs, exchange traded funds as the proxy. And then we drill into some individual stocks, which we'll get to in a minute. But to, to begin, let's start off just at the top, Joe. And sure. we'll, we'll talk about some of these, these ETFs. And, you know, just a, a, a quick, it's anecdotal, but, you know, the Q2 list, every single one of the ETFs that we highlighted generated a positive return in the second quarter. These are the ones that were seasonally strongest going into the quarter. Um, you had the, the, the Dow Jones 30, corporate bond ETF, community bond ETF, NASDAQ 100, the S&P itself, basic materials, financials, technology and uh, consumer discretionary. Uh, all of them posted strong performance last quarter in line with their seasonal trend. No idea if that'll happen again, um, but we do have two consecutive quarters where that's happened. So, you know, these are the 
strongest exchange traded funds, so sectors, industries, for the fourth quarter out of the universe that, that we track. And you'll notice a few things here, Joe, in this list. We've got you know, small caps and mid caps being strongest, uh, posting returns in nine of the past 10 years in the fourth quarter. And we provide to our clients the average return, the median return, the standard deviation and correlation, to the S&P 500. <clears throat> and I like to look at the median return. Gotten gives you, I think, a, 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 good, a good idea of where to focus. And looking at median returns, um, you know, suggest that, hey, maybe it's time to buy some small cap stocks, Joe. Right. You know, 8. We, we, have a, we have a big long list of them. Yeah, you know, 8.68% return um, for the IWM historically in the fourth quarter. That's the median return. Um, the capital markets ETF, the KCE, also median return 8.8%, something that, that people should be aware of. What's interesting to me, Joe, too, is that on the list this quarter, <clears throat> the S&P is strong, but it's not as seasonally strong as mid, the small caps or the MDY mid caps. Yep. So now again, what's, what's interesting to me is that all of those are pretty well correlated to the SPY. Like there, there are no real outliers there. Yeah, that coincides actually, if you, I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity to take a look at the Stock Traders Almanac. It's something that's been around for a long time. Come new one comes out every year. It's kind of like the Farmer's Almanac only for <laughs> investors. And it kind of corresponds with, with, you know, their best months of the year. So, you know, they look back historically and they say, okay, what are the best months of the year for the, for the market? So it typically runs from some point in October being your launch pad through, you know, the following April, May, something like that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so you typically the market's up and the stock market accounts for two thirds of, of a stock's move. So, you know, a lot of these other baskets are up. But again, what's interesting to me is that, that small mid caps tend to have the better performance. And, you know, I, that also makes sense because, you know, you have um, uh, this kind of a January, in fact, Christmas holiday, Santa Claus rally kind of thing that tends <laughs> to reward small cap stocks as well. So, you know, as you're thinking about your portfolio and you're hunting for ideas, Maybe you know, give a little extra weight to the ideas that happen to be a little bit smaller in market cap. Um, the other thing I would just point out here is that the the semiconductor industry, historically speaking, the book to bill ratio, which measures the you know orders that are coming in to the semiconductor companies and being filled, the book to bill is usually strongest beginning and around this period and then running through springtime. And I think that that makes sense intuitively, Joe because we're coming up on the holiday season. We have new releases of all these consumer electronic devices, et cetera. And as you know, production ramps for those devices, um, you would think that maybe some of these companies would end up benefiting. So Absolutely. industrials, consumer discretionary, which makes sense because the holiday season, again, consumer stocks tend to do, consumer discretionary stocks, retailers, tend to do pretty well in the third quarter in anticipation and then also in the fourth quarter through when they report earnings, usually in February of the following year. So, I mean, you look at the list, it's, it's tilting you towards financials, banks, capital markets, insurers. It's tilting you towards in industrials and consumer discretionary or retail stocks and semiconductors. Yeah, and out of those, are there, are there, any, uh, are there any specific stocks that you would that you would pick out as either being having a particularly bullish outlook or simply just having kind of an interesting potential trajectory. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what I did is I went through the list of the seasonally strongest that we shared with our members last week. And I just picked out you know, a few of them. I thought we could just punch up some charts, Joe, and you know, sort of talk about a few of them um, that might be intriguing. They, they were intriguing to me because they, they not only have strong seasonality, so they, they showed up in that seasonality report, but they also have a strong score in the overall scoring system, which again, includes all seven of the factors that we discussed at the top of the episode. So, you know, the first one I wanted to take a look at is the one on the screen, monolithic power systems. And that's not a household name in the semiconductor space. Um, but it is a name that maybe investors ought to be paying some pretty close attention to. Um, you know, it has a, a, a high score in the research, it has strong seasonality. It benefits from the fact that it falls into that seasonally strong semiconductor 
industry. Um, and as you can see, you know, there are some things just by looking at this, you can kind of get a feel for the scoring system overall. You know, you've got earnings that are going from 374 and 18 to 388 and 19 to 484 and 20 to 525 in 2021. What COVID headwind? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, so you've got this really nice uh, earnings history, a good solid history of beats. And, you know, if you look at the buy volume to the sell volume, which falls into our money flow components, we've got rising volume on the buy days, the up days, um, and, you know, lower volume, below average volume on the sell days. And, you know, you might look at this, Joe, and say, but why would I, it's, it's at all to all time highs. But, I mean, we can go back and look. I mean, there's studies have been done. O'Neill is probably famous for, for doing a lot of them. You know, sometimes the new high list is actually a much better source of ideas than the new low list. Uh, actually, I would say it, it almost always is. Um, winners have a tendency to win. And intuitively, that, that, that should make sense because you look at it, Joe, and you say, okay, well, who here is like, thank God I'm back to my cost, I can sell. <laughs> There's nobody, you know, what's your overhead resistance? So, I mean, if you're looking for a semiconductor stock, which is a seasonally strong basket, um, maybe you consider something like this. And what they do, Joe, is they do, um, think about um, managing power for consumer electronics devices, electronic uh, internet of things devices in your home. Think about the consoles that are coming out this, this winter. Think about how important it is for smartphones to have their batteries last as long as humanly possible, especially in a 5G, shift to 5G. I mean, those are all tailwinds that theoretically could benefit monolithic power. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's going back to um, like when to, when to buy and if it, if it makes sense to buy on the, on a 52 week high or even an all time high, it kind of goes back to one of your, one of your key philosophies, like let your, let your winners win, uh, which you kind of hinted at too. Like in the, in the same way, if you were to, if you, if you owned this stock, you would not necessarily sell right now because it's been it's been performing so well, and you know it's a it's a very clear kind of upward trajectory. So yeah, it's, it's fact, important. A, yeah, a good argument, Joe, could be made that not only should you not sell, you you might want to actually bump it up a little bit, in in of course your diversified portfolio. Right. You, none of us would go out and make this our our only bet and buy short term calls on it, right? Of so, course not. I'm gonna get levered four four times by short term calls and one. We're not stop. we're not Wall Street bets on Reddit. We are disciplined investors. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so that's one in one of them. And then I I thought for another one I would punch up is just in the consumer discretionary space, which again another seasonally strong area, investors might want to consider is uh, Starbucks. You know we've got latte fever. Yeah, it's pumpkin spice season. It's pumpkin spice. <laughs> We've got the pumpkin spice lattes flying out of the drive-thru here at Starbucks. And uh, a lot of stocking stuffers, are, uh, stockings are probably going to have gift cards for Starbucks in them. Um, yep. You know, they seasonality, they, they experience strong, solid demand. Um, they've got headwinds, obviously, tied to COVID. That's why their revenue has fallen. That's why their earnings this year have fallen from 283 to an expected 96 cents. You know, Joe, I think that's also a good time to, to interject it. We're less interested in the current year earnings versus last year. We don't really look at that. What we look at is the forward earnings, right? right? Because stocks are a discounting mechanism. So I think a lot of people say to themselves, yeah, but look how bad the economy is today. And look how bad earnings are today. And look how bad revenue is today. I don't want to say who cares because you need to know where you are today to figure out where you're going tomorrow. But I think that it's really important for investors to remember, focus less on, on this and more on what could happen in the future. So again, exactly. 2021 looking to go from 96 cents in 2020 to $2.69 in 2021. That's big. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that could, be, that could be the headline that people focus on that helps to drive the stock higher over the course of the next quarter or so. So here's a consumer discretionary stock that might be interesting uh, and worth taking a look at. 
Um, in industrials, Joe, uh, one that jumps out to me is Little Fuse, another non-household name uh, that's seeing a, a drop off in earnings this year, but theoretically could have a really nice bounce back year next year. Little Fuse, Joe, they um, make fuses that are used in automotive, um, electronic devices in your home, internet of things, you name it. So if you think that the world is getting more electrified, um, then Little Fuse is likely to have more of their components within those devices, and that theoretically should provide it with revenue and earnings tailwinds. Um, so that would be an industrial name that you might want to consider owning. And then if you just jump over to the finance side of things, because again, that was a, a relatively strong seasonal basket. Um, in my view, it's hard to go wrong with a core name like a MasterCard. MasterCard's a great stock. Yeah, I think so. I mean, because they don't have the risk that a lot of banks have, right? I mean, if you don't get a deal done, then you could see delinquencies rise in defaults, impair ba uh, balance sheets for banks. MasterCard just takes a little piece of, you know, every sale. And yep. that's a pretty good business to be in the fourth quarter going into holiday shopping season. Absolutely. And the, the beauty of the beauty of those those credit card stocks, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, is that they, you know, as long as people are as long as people are, are purchasing stuff, which they certainly are, it's a little bit different than it was at this time in twenty nineteen, but people people are still buying stuff on their credit cards and so their revenue is going nowhere. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I think I you know, I think those are good ones to focus on. Yeah. And just a just a quick question for you um, that our viewers might like to know too. Those uh, those charts that you were just viewing are those are those available for anybody to view? That's a Market Smith product. So mm -hmm. um, that's actually a, an O'Neill Investors Business Daily product that you can purchase right off their website. I like them because it gives all of my information in one spot. Yes. You know, I can see the earnings trend. I can see the revenue growth trend. You know, I can see the money flow trend. I can see all of these things that go into our system. So when I have a score, a high scoring stock that shows up in one of our reports and I'm interested in it, um, you know, we have 1500 stocks in that universe and the whole idea is to funnel it down to a small number. So I'll take that small number and I'll punch up the chart on it and I'll be like, okay, is this worth investigating a little bit more on? So I take a high scoring stock, I'll take a charting service like this, I punch it up, um, otherwise, if you don't have this, you can obviously just go to Yahoo Finance and look on the statistics tab under the stock, uh, and it will show you the year over growth, your growth and earnings and, and some other, you know, important metrics, including um, short interest and, and other things. So you can kind of, you can build it yourself and kind of see, okay, okay. Yeah. But I think that, you know, that's, that's the key is that, you know, our research is, is a machine. It takes a large amount of information, condenses it into a small number of ideas that we can decide to dive in a little deeper on and, you know, fi hopefully find some really nice winners. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of information out there. And I think that, I think that these days everybody's looking for like the, the most kind of simple and streamlined way to view it. Another thing that viewers and listeners should keep in mind too, is that if you, if you use a brokerage service that isn't Robinhood, um, we don't need to go into all the things that are wrong with Robinhood right now. But if you use, you know, Fidelity or Ameritrade or Schwab, et cetera, et cetera, most of those, most of those charts that are, you know, pretty, pretty advanced and they show a lot of data, most of those are downloadable. Like I know I use Fidelity and if I open up, like if I expand one of the charts on a particular stock or ETF or whatever, it'll give me the option to download all of the data into, into Excel. So if you really wanted to, if you're, if you're a real like data nut, you could download all of that data and just build your own chart. So yeah, and I bet you a lot of our, I bet you a lot of our listeners are data nuts. Yeah, I, I I hope so. I certainly am, and you certainly are. So yeah, common common interests for sure. Yeah, absolutely. The other shout out I would give just on this whole, you know, what are some of the tools that I can use to help that are helpful in, in shortening my learning curve or my time to be able to research a particular stock. I also like Y charts a lot. Um, yep. You know, they do have uh, a paid part of it. They have some limited free functionality as well, but that might be a, uh, something for, for our listeners to check out as well. Absolutely. There are certainly plenty of, plenty of great resources out there and a lot of them, a lot of them are free, which a lot of people don't realize. 
Yeah. Any, so I think we're, I think we've gotten, gotten to the point where we've, we've covered all of our bases. So if you have any, any parting words for us, um, we'll leave it at that. No, I'm just going to, you know, stay the course. Don't get shaken out of um, great stocks based on, you know, whatever is the flavor of the day in the news cycle. Uh, stay true to your discipline. And, you know, the other thing, Joe, we talk about this regularly, you know, you know, as well as I do. You know, journal, journal your decisions, you know, that way when you see something weird happen, you can flip to the journal and say, did this have any bearing at all in my decision to buy this stock? And if it doesn't, then ignore it. Absolutely. It's all about that thesis, right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we'll, I guess we'll leave it at there and we'll plan on seeing you all next week or hearing from you all next week. Uh, so with that, Todd and Joe signing off.